Welcome to the PowerPoint show regarding electrons. This is Unit 12. The sections to look at in your textbook are 3.6 and 3.7. We're going to take a look at here is uh, pretty much more detail about electrons. Because electrons turn out to be fairly important. If we take a look at uh, the topics we'll be dealing with here. <coughs> Excuse me. We look <coughs> looking at something called line spectra and what their implications are. We're not going to go into great depth in line spectra and how we get from here to there, but they tell us some things about electrons that are fairly important. We're going to look at determining the maximum number of electrons we can have in a particular atom and, and pretty much how those things are arranged. And also we're going to look at what's called a quantum mechanical interpretation of those electrons. So that'll be unit 12. So we have a picture at this point of the atom as being a nucleus that has in it the protons and neutrons and then also has electrons somehow around the outside. The somehow, uh, when we think about the nucleus, the nucleus part itself, the nucleus is very, very tiny. Go back to Rutherford's experiment. The nucleus is very, very tiny. And most of the atom is going to be empty space. And so inside that nucleus, we have the protons and neutrons. We have most of the mass of the whole thing. But the nucleus is really tiny compared to the size of the atom. Now, you know, an example of that, uh, if you think about, if you take the period at the end of a sentence in a textbook or some book you're reading, and you put it at the center of a football field on the 50-yard line, that's about what the size of the atom is, from one end zone to the other, and the nucleus is as big as that period is in the end. So it's mostly empty space. What's important about that is that as the atoms approach each other, the electrons will be the initial contact between different atoms. And so we need to know something about what those electrons do in that circumstance. Certainly they're governed by how many protons you have in a nucleus, but they also are the ones who do the most most highly active interaction as things approach. So it's very important for us to understand something about the electron. And so we're going to look at it. Most of our understanding of it comes from the interaction of matter with energy. But let's take a look at an example of this. So what we're going to think about here is we're going to think about light as having wave-like properties. You kind of know about a wave probably is a wave is like a uh, on a rope. You have a wave going up and down. It has something called a wavelength associated with it. It's how long it is before that wave repeats itself. We're not going to go overly big into the excruciating details of that, but what's understood about light is that the different colors that you see are associated with different wavelengths of light. So the longer the wavelength is, the redder the color is going to be. As a matter of fact, the longer and longer the wavelength gets to be, you get into radio waves and TV waves and all sorts of things along those waves, m microwaves. As you go to shorter wavelengths, you're going to end up with things like uh, ultraviolet rays and things of that nature. And so when we talk about light, we talk about what's called the visible spectrum. And down here I have this Roy G. Biv thing written out. What that does is helps you remember this is just a portion of the spectrum. This is the wavelength in nanometers along here. And if I'm at 700 nanometers, a fairly long wavelength on here, I'm going to be red. I'll have red light that I'm seeing. If I'm at 500, it's green. If I'm at 400, it's in the purple range. And so it's just that wavelength change. All the light travels the same speed. But when I look at it, the colors will be dependent on what the wavelength is going to be. So we can use this information to understand something about wavelengths, something about electrons, because we have to interact with matter to understand something about it. So, the important part there is different colors correspond to light that has a different wavelength. The result of that has a different energy. We haven't gone into a lot of excruciating detail on it. There's a relationship for that. Uh, the energy is equal to some constant times the frequency of the light or some constant divided by the wavelength of the light. But <coughs> the idea is if I see a certain color light coming out, it's telling me something about energy that I've got. And so, Let's take a look at an experiment where we talk about this interaction of light with matter and see what happens. So a lot of our early information came from something called line spectra. Uh, notice here the little linguistic lesson here. Spectra is plural. Spectrum is singular. So if I go and I take a spectrum, that's one. If I've been in a lab all day taking spectra, that's plural. So if I take a glass tube and I put a gas in it, and this is just pretty much like a neon light if you want to think of it that way, put a high voltage across it, the gas will emit a light containing various colors that's entirely dependent on what gas I have inside of that tube. There will be different colors for different gases inside of the tube. If I take the light coming out of that tube and I look at it and separate it into those colors of the spectrum, here's what I'm going to find out about it. Is over here, this is a up here on the top part is that's the continuous spectrum 
all the way from 400 nanometers to 700. This is all the visible part, by the way. There's also, we can do these same things in the ultraviolet, things we can't see. <coughs> but we're going to focus on the visible part right now. So along the left-hand side here, we've got five different elements, sodium, hydrogen, calcium, magnesium, and neon, all along the left-hand side in here. What you'll see is if I take this tube and I'll put in, let's say, hydrogen is the most famous one to start with. I put hydrogen into the tube, and I light it up. If I had you in class, I'd bring this in and do it in the classroom. Uh, and if I had it with me now, I'd probably record it for you, but I don't. And so if I look at the hydrogen, I've, I have billions of hydrogen atoms in this glass tube. I put high voltage across it. What I see coming out is four lines. One, two, three, four, and those correspond to particular colors in the continuous spectrum. But you notice the big gaps in here? All those atoms in there, I'm only getting four lines coming out. This is very unusual, kind of a strange thing to think about. It requires some kind of, some kind of a an explanation. Uh, notice different elements have different spectra. No two of these spectra look alike. <coughs> if I lined up all the spectra of all the elements, no two of them would look exactly alike. A field where this is very important is in astronomy. When you're trying to understand something about a star, you can look at the light coming in, you can break it apart into the wavelengths you have, you can see things like shifting as to whether the stars and Earth are moving toward each other, away from each other, all sorts of things you can figure out by looking at spectra. But for us, the important part is, what does this have to do with electrons? And so, uh, this idea that only a certain number of energies can be seen, no matter where I got the hydrogen from, no matter how many atoms I put in, doesn't matter at all. In 1913, Niels Bohr provided an explanation for these spectra that we see. And it goes along these lines. <coughs> a lot of text again. Here's your picture of the atom for right now. This nucleus in here is way bigger than it would be in real life. But out here, what Bohr said is, okay, suppose that the electrons are confined to move at certain energies out around this nucleus. So, so this electron right here, or on the right here, this electron here can be here. He could be in here. He could be in another one of these orbit-looking things out here, but he can never, ever, ever be caught in between. And so what that means then is the picture looks more like this. It's, it's, we call this quantitization of energy. You can only have certain energies. I give the example up here like an ATM machine. In an ATM machine, you can't go get a $1.98 out. It's not going to happen. And so what I want to look at then is what is this, how does this help us describe this thing? So. Um, the idea is that the electrons exist in these discrete energy levels outside the nucleus, and so what the picture looks like is like this. It's going to be kind of ugly. Is here's a the n number in the diagram here. So here's n equals one. Here's n equals two, three, four, and so on. All we're doing there is we're numbering the orbits, if you will, of the electrons from the shell. So what happens now if I have a hydrogen <coughs> atom and I have an electron inside this first shell? What can happen is when I put that big high voltage across there, boom, like this, it goes up here, jumps up to a higher energy orbit, and then turns around once that pulse of energy is passed and falls back down. And when it falls back down, it's going to do like this thing that we have here. It can fall from level 2 down to level 1. It can fall from level 3 to level 2, level 3 to level 1, all sorts of jumps it can make in there. And every time it does that jump, Notice that these are not evenly spaced, and so the energy over here is going to be different. If I jump from 2 to 1, here's 2, and here's 1, my jump is like going from negative a half to negative, like negative one and a half ish or so. But if I jump from 4 to 3, it's much smaller. What I see then in my spectrum is I see different colors of light coming out because they correlate with that energy. And so, so the color we see is related to the energy. The, ener the idea that we only have discrete energies gives us the idea of quantitization, the idea that they can only have certain energies at all. And so that's, that's about 1913. Bohr comes up with that. That's what we call pretty much in the classical days of physics because we haven't come to quantum mechanics yet. And in quantum mechanics, what happens? A couple things. Um, Bohr's model worked excellently for hydrogen, which has one electron. As soon as you have two electrons, all bets are off. It doesn't work so well. And so there had to be a, a new vision emerge of what this thing looks like. So this is in the 1920s, typically, when we think about it, is a lot of growth in the area called quantum mechanics. And so 
uh, what quantum mechanics it deals with, and it's a fairly interesting topic, it's a topic all of it in, unto its own, but what we think about here is the electron has both wave-like and particle-like properties. Light by this time had been known to have wave-like and particle-like properties, so we turned around in the 1920s and said, hey, wait a minute, maybe this electron we're thinking about as a particle also has wave-like properties, and that would help us describe what we see. And so what we do now is we shift our discussion a little bit from talking about orbits, like planetary systems, we're not talking about that, we're going to talk about the fact that the electron has a wave-like and particle-like property, one of the key uh, postulates in quantum mechanics principles is a Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it tells us we can't know exactly where an electron is and what its speed is, if you will, uh, at the same time. And so all of a sudden all the bets are off. We know a little bit, but the more we know one thing, the less we know another in the end. And so what happens to is we kind of change our terminology a little bit. And rather than talking about orbits, as Bohr was doing, he's thinking about planets, we talk about things called orbitals, regions in space in which there's a high probability of finding an electron. So like 90% certain it's somewhere in this volume, which means we're about 10% certain it's not. It's somewhere else. It, it's really hard to believe that this helped clarify something by, make, by saying right off the bat that we don't get to know everything there is to know about it. There are four primary orbital types that we'll look at, S, P, D and F. If they keep discovering elements at the pace they are, and I'm not sure if we might not be in a slowdown right now at that point, uh, the next set of orbitals would start with G. They'll go alphabetically after this, but so far we can handle all the elements we know by these four types of orbitals. So let's get sort of a visual on it. So we have the S, P's, so here's my S, here's my P, here's my D, and here are my F orbitals over here. And you notice that my S orbitals there actually is only one S orbital okay, in each shell. So this is, you can't read this very well. This thing is labeled 1S, this is labeled 2S, this is labeled 3S. So each, <coughs> each numbered shell, each numbered shell has in it exactly one S orbital. Each numbered shell has in it three P orbitals. So here's one, here's another one that kind of like dumbbells over here. And just oriented differently. One's vertical, the other two are crosswise in, a, in the plane. D orbitals, there are five of those, and they get to look uglier and uglier as we go. These are like crossed dumbbells, but then you got this funny looking thing here with a donut in it at the bottom of it. And then the F orbitals, they get even funnier, as you see over here. And so when you look at these, the first thing that will strike you is these don't make any sense whatsoever. Okay, and that's okay. If that's what your first initial thought is, that's wonderful, that's great. What we want to understand about these is that all these do is tell us that if I have an electron, for example, if I have an electron in this d orbital right here, right here, the nucleus is at the center of that coordinate system, right in there is a the nucleus. What those lobes represent to me is there's a 90% chance of finding an electron in that orbital somewhere inside of those lobes, some si somewhere inside that volume. <coughs> so we took it, we clarified quantum mechanics by saying we don't get to know everything. We're, we're getting to a point, don't worry about it. Uh, so here's some things to think about in orbitals. Not all shells have all orbitals. So for example, in the first shell, if n is equal to 1, that one is closest to the nucleus, the only subshell or the orbitals I have in there are s orbitals. Okay. If I get out to the third shell, I have 3s and 3p and 3d, I have orbitals along there. So each shell can have at most one s orbital, 3p's, 5d's, and 7f orbitals. I just noticed I spelled orbital wrong, I'm not going to fix it right now, I'll do it later. Um, so, so when you think about that, uh, what happens is Everything, n equals 1 can have an s orbital, n equals 2 can have 3p orbitals plus an s orbital, n equals 3 can have s, p's, and d's, n equals 4 can have n, s, you can have s, p, d, and f, and all the ones beyond that can have s, p, d, f, and others, but we don't need those yet. Okay, So each one of these orbitals can hold in it at most two electrons. So what we're going to get to is sort of a road map as to how the electrons go, and what we're going to do the next unit to give you something again to look forward to is we'll get all this mind-boggling stuff kind of out of the way and look at the periodic table and understand how well it works in terms of these electron setups that we're looking at in here. So how do you do something like electron configuration? So diagram at the right over here 
can be used to do that. Notice here I have 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, 3d, 4d, 5d, 4f, I because the table can go down to 6s, 6p, 6d, 6f, and all across. And that's fine, but I just gave you a little segment to start with. We're not going to become experts in electron configurations and all the nuances. We just want to get a sense of it <coughs> because it helps us understand something about the chemistry parts. So each one of these S subshells can hold at most two electrons. P can hold six. D can hold ten. F can hold fourteen. So we need to fill these things in. We start up here at the tail of this arrow. We we'll start coming down here. So if I had six electrons put in, I put two in my one S like this. Come to the tail of the next arrow, put two in my 2s like that, that's two and two is four. I've put four electrons in so far, and then I'd take it, I'd put two electrons into my 2p. Okay, so I can fill them in looking something like that. Uh, if we take a look at an example uh, of this, let's look at beryllium with four electrons. I'm going to try to do it. I don't know if this will work or not. Okay, so if I have beryllium that has four electrons in it, Wrong page. I figure it. Beryllium has four electrons, and it looks like this. So if I have to go with four electrons, I come over to here, and I forgot my arrows. Arrow, 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 like that. Come back here, I put two electrons into the 1s, because that's all I can hold. So I write 1s, and I put a 2 up here. So the 1 indicates it's in the first shell, the s indicates it's in an s subshell and the 2 indicates that it has two electrons in it. Since I have beryllium and he has four electrons all together, then I have to go two more electrons. So I come back to the tail of this arrow, and there's a 2s. So I go 2s, 2 like that, and that's what we call my electron configuration for beryllium. Okay. Let's look at some other examples here. And here, so I've got uh, phosphorus up here. Now, if you look at the periodic table, Table. Phosphorus is over here, number 15, so that means in a neutral phosphorus atom I have 15 electrons. So if I want to write the electron configuration for phosphorus, what I do is think about my 15 electrons. And say, okay, so with my 15 electrons, I have phosphorus, I have to put in 15 electrons. I start out up here, and I start out, oh, get my camera back. I'm going to start out up here and say, okay, I'm going to put two electrons into this 1s, so it's 1s2. And then I'm going to put two electrons into this 2s, and so that's going to be 2s2. Come back to the tail of this arrow, and I'm going to put six electrons into my 2p, 2p6. How many electrons do I have now? I got four and six is, two and two is four, and six is ten and up here to the 2p, so now I have to go in here, I have five more electrons, well I can only put two in that, so I put 3s2, and that means I have two electrons left, three electrons left over, so I come back to 3p, and it's 3p3. There's my electron configuration for phosphorus. Okay, so it just kind of follows through, you can pick any, and, and we're going to stay up <coughs> in the upper periods, upper rows of the periodic table, because it gets a little bit uglier as you go further down, we aren't too worried about that, we just want to get the concept down. I have other examples here you can look at if you'd like to. Uh, oxygen. So oxygen has eight electrons. So he's going to look something like this. And so it's just a matter of going through and just filling that thing in. Okay. So that's your introduction to electrons. What they do, what they look like, how they're arranged toward the outside. There's a whole bunch of theory in it that we aren't going to worry about very much. We're interested in, remember, why do we care about the electrons? Because they're the front wave of these atoms getting together and reacting. The nucleus is really tiny. The electrons are way out there. They're the ones that are going to be shared. They're going to be traded. They're going to be bartered. There are all sorts of things going on.